bit of a keynote uh, talk is going to be given by Professor Ben Leincooler, who's a colleague and friend of mine from the University of Edinburgh, and his background is very much in um, molecular dynamics and algorithms to, to uh, do that better and faster in general. In recent times, he's been getting quite active in the machine learning space and has a, a position at the Alan Turing Institute in London, which um, is, is a place through which he's been able to start developing uh, the interaction between machine learning and molecular dynamics. So this session, to, uh, the first one today and the second one are really around drug um, things to do with molecular dynamics and drug discovery. I'll try to bring the COVID-19 topic to bear on this when I can. But it looks like Ben is all set up. I can see his slides there. And I'm assuming, Ben, you're ready to take over now from me. Yep, I am. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, so Peter asked me to uh, to give this talk, and um, you know, I, it's a little bit of a challenge for me because um, I don't really work in computational medical biology. Um, many of the things that are on the program look extremely interesting. By the way, I was very keen to meet all of you, um, but I, I do have a little bit of a sore throat today, so you probably don't want to meet me. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to 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 follow what Peter suggested, which was that I give a kind of an overview of uh, my perspective on how things are shaping up uh, in the in the area between uh, machine learning and molecular dynamics. And then I'll talk about a couple of examples of the work that we've been doing recently that uh, relate to this topic. So, uh, so first of all, what do I mean by molecular dynamics? And I, I'm sorry if some of the slides are quite general or introductory. Um, but that's the kind of the purpose of the talk, I suppose. Um, so I think of molecular dynamics as, as a broad class of methods, including things like uh, constant energy, molecular dynamics, uh, you know, solving Hamiltonian systems, um, but also uh, things, devices that are added into the equations of motion in order to make the models more relevant for applications like thermostats and barostats and things like that. Um, so uh, I, I spent a lot of time in recent years working on Langevin dynamics techniques and uh, other schemes to preserve uh, the, the constant temperature ensemble. And then uh, beyond that, there's a lot of work that's been developed uh, in trying to make molecular dynamics models more relevant for the kinds of scales of phenomena that people need to study. Uh, so uh, you have uh, various coarse graining techniques, and I lump all this together under the broad umbrella of molecular dynamics. So dissipated particle dynamics would also be a kind of molecular dynamics technique. Now, on the other hand, um, the, the meeting is about uh, the uh, interplay of machine learning and uh, molecular modeling techniques. And uh, machine learning has really exploded in recent years on the scene. And uh, you know, I think 10 years ago, even if you had said that I, you know, would I be working in uh in machine learning and trying to use machine learning techniques, I probably would have said probably not. Um, it's just evolved so rapidly that now I see most of my work going in this direction. Uh, so uh I you know I I've, I've given some examples here of the types of machine learning techniques that people are developing. And there's so much work in this space that it's almost impossible to keep up with the individual contributions that come out on a daily basis. You kind of have to keep track of sort of uh, communities or areas in machine learning rather than trying to follow, you know, in detail all of the different directions. So, um, but just putting together a few examples, um, you know, I would mention that one kind of machine learning is about approximating functional relationships. So you can think of it as a kind of generalized approximation theory, approximation theory being a technique that's been around since, you know, well, since uh, since people started to do any kind of computation and even before that. Um, and then it's it's evolved into methods that that you know are are, are really building uh, approaches for you know hetero heterogeneous data sets and things like that and trying to approximate functional relationships where you know your in input space can't be discretized in a simple way. 
And uh, so uh, there are various types of kernel methods that are that are being explored there. And NNs means neural networks, which is one of the hottest areas of development. And then there are um, methods that are are really about clustering point sets. And sometimes when you look at these, they seem very abstract the way they're formulated. But of course, they have widespread application. You can adapt these methods to many problems uh, in molecular modeling. And uh, finally, there are a lot of methods that uh, are trying to do something using a nonlinear representation. Uh, so they're actually trying to learn a manifold uh, geometry for the data sets. So you're just given some, some points, let's say in Euclidean space, and you try and understand what that underlying, perhaps low dimensional manifold looks like and uh, map its structure. So those are just examples. I think those do cover quite a bit of the things that are being done in machine learning. And um, so with these kinds of tools, you can you can do a lot of things right right away with combining uh, molecular dynamics and machine learning. You can take all that data that you generate in in large scale simulations, and you can extract information from the MD data. So there are a lot of methods in this category, and this is sort of just to survey a few examples. Um, you know, there are methods for trying to, to learn the, the reaction coordinates in complex systems by sort of mining this, this trajectory data. Um, methods like this molecular dynamic fingerprints, that's a, again, a, a way to, to represent sort of properties uh, directly from simulation data, just extracting properties. And, uh, and then you can take that a step further, and there's some really nice work that's been done, particularly by Frank Noe, in this area of uh, extracting Markov models, which gives you also time scale information. So you know you can then use that to investigate time scales of uh, long term transitions. So it's, it's really gives you a lot more insight into what you're looking at when you have all that data dumped out from molecular dynamics. So, uh, but there are a lot of other methods that are being uh, built up in this space. A lot of them use the ideas of Bayesian inference and statistics concepts. Um, so this is, of course, uh, uh, Bayes' rule. This is, by the way, uh, Thomas Bayes was a University of Ed Edinburgh graduate, and we uh, now are planning to ask for some royalties for every time people use Bayes' formula. Um, so he was a graduate in 1721 from uh, my university, but uh, in theology, in fact. Um, but he did take mathematics classes and he, he was very interested in this, this mathematics concept, which he developed for a long time. Uh, so the, the idea is that you can relate the, uh, the, the distribution for some parameters of a statistical model to, uh, to the, the observations that you you make of data that are supposed to be drawn from that model and uh, the the rule is very simple and it allows you to capture that that dist parameter distribution in terms of a prior which is something that really localizes the parameters and somehow confines the the domain in which you're searching for a good representation and a likelihood function which describes the model itself so this is a probability distribution for the, the data given parameters. Um, so you can already apply that actually in very uh, straightforward ways to something like binary classification. Uh, that's just trying to separate uh, two with one of these class classification problems. Um, or you can build more complicated models which are using uh, neural networks to represent a map. And uh, so this is a, the family of perceptron networks, which is one class of neural networks. I mean, there are many more complicated neural networks on the market and new ones being developed all the time. So these, I can view these as just general models with a lot of parameters. Um, and in my talk, I won't be concerned so much with why uh, neural networks are such efficient um, methods for classifying data, but I will concentrate on some of the nuts and bolts of working with those kinds of models. Um, so now using tools like this, so using neural networks and, uh, and the 
idea of uh, the Bayesian model framework. Um, one can apply uh, molecular machine learning in, in, in other aspects of molecular modeling. So, uh, for example, one can try to learn energies and force fields for complex models. And uh, there are quite a few nice works in this direction. I've been glancing over these works and I haven't actually published anything in this area myself, but I'm, I'm quite interested in, in these kinds of techniques. Uh, so, you, you know, you, the idea is that you, you don't have to know, you don't have to have a priori a classical model for your molecular system. Uh, in fact, there may no, not be any really good classical model, but you can use uh, simulation data in order to extract an approximate uh, model, maybe an approximate force field, and then use that to do a molecular simulation. And there's another step if you go beyond learning energies and force fields, you can also talk about learning the wave functions and properties from uh, machine learning. So uh, this is a, maybe a little bit more challenging because you, you lose a little bit the specificity of what you're working on, what you're actually computing. Uh, but it's also being applied, it, it seems, in an effective way in these papers here. And I was particularly uh, 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 interested in this last paper here um, by the group of Klaus Mueller, um, which I thought did a nice job of presenting a uh, methodology for, uh, for computing quantum mechanical properties using machine learning. Uh, so uh, here you're actually defining a loss function, which is in terms of the Hamiltonian matrix and overlap and energy and the forces. And then um, the idea is to fit this model uh, using a neural network um, to your DFT data and use that to uh, do rapid extraction of, of properties. So those are some examples of the kinds of things that, that people are using. And there's a lot of challenges that come out of supervised learning. I mean, they arise in these examples, but they also arise in other areas. In fact, these are kind of the, the problems that are driving forward the development of uh, machine learning techniques and neural networks. So one issue is poor generalization, which for a mathematician means instability and poor transferability. So uh, you can think of this in different ways, but uh, I like to break it down into these two, in particular, uh, instability of the trained map with respect to perturbation of the inputs to the map, and also instability uh, with respect to the perturbation of the data set or the training procedure. So the idea that you can take an image and make a very tiny change to it, let's say just alter a few pixels and, uh, and end up with the image being classified as a completely different creature or completely different class of images, it just kind of makes you wonder what the heck we're doing here. And I think that these problems rise in many areas of machine learning. And, and even if you don't see the problems in your practical application very often, these kinds of instabilities, just the presence of them and the lack of understanding of why they're happening, I think is, is, is making a lot of pe people pause in, in using and relying on machine learning techniques. Um, there's a, a related problem to, the, to this instability with respect to perturbation of the data set. You can think of actually having the data evolving. So you're actually being fed data from a source so you have dynamic training data, and that's the domain of online learning. Um, that's really also relying on having some understanding of how how the uh, the perturbation of that data would would affect the the output of your training, the model that you obtain. And uh, then related to this, of course, is the issue of uncertainty quantification, because we would like to actually be able to quantify the error that we're making when we're using a machine learning model. And of course, there are many other Im important problems that need to be addressed. And a lot of you are working on topics in learning at scale, using distributed algorithms and so on. There are very many interesting uh, questions in that area. So just maybe to put some a few things onto a table, 
um, you know, comparing molecular dynamics and machine learning, uh, you know, you have high dimensionality in both of these two frameworks. Um, in, in molecular dynamics, because you have a large number of physical coordinates, probably, in uh, machine learning, because you may have, well, either a large number of parameters in the model that you're using or uh, a very large data set. This is what we mean by big data problems. And, and then the way that they're formulated is quite different. So in, in molecular dynamics, the model is somehow built up on physical principles, even if some corners are cut in making that model um, there's often an underlying physical basis for what you're doing. In machine learning, at least in the sort of abstract computer science framework of machine learning, the, the models are purely artificial. They're, they're statistical models. And only through the kind of combination with um, you know, molecular modeling know-how can you actually turn those things into something useful. Uh, the computational tasks look very different. Uh, in, in working with these different types of models. Um, but there are some similarities, and I'm going to come to that in, in the second part of my talk. And, um, and then uh, there's a lot of development of the computer architectures that underpin the simulations. Uh, we've been working on codes in both of these domains, uh, you know, MD codes and also machine learning codes. And the foundation in most of machine learning is, is Python and in MD, it's, it's usually compiled languages. Um, but there's also some resonance uh, developing between the two, the two areas. And, uh, and then, you know, they, there are different things that come into play in terms of the algorithmic limitations. But I would say some things you can see that are similar are things like the sampling time in molecular models. It's difficult to sample all the accessible states of a given molecular model, even if you have a good uh, force field, and uh, in machine learning, the training time that it takes to, to train a complex model. So, uh, and then these issues about model robustness, uh, sort of reliability of the models, uh, which are still very much in flux in terms of getting good concepts. So I'm now going to focus on two areas, um, uh, so two demonstrations of the work that we're, we're doing. Uh, so one is applying machine learning techniques for molecular dynamics to try to improve molecular dynamics. And the idea is essentially localizing diffusion maps and using that to robustly accelerate molecular sampling. And the, uh, the second uh, uh, topic that I'm going to describe is using molecular dynamics ideas in machine learning. So this is really quite different, um, actually developing new training methods based on, on the ideas and the algorithms of molecular dynamics, uh, and we call these thermodynamic training methods, to enhance robustness and efficiency. So I'll start with this first area. Um, I think we'll, we'll hold questions until the end. This is an unusual situation. Usually when you give a talk at a conference, um, you, you're getting a lot of interjections as you speak. Now, I don't really object to that normally, but I want to stay on track in terms of the time of the presentation. So I don't mind uh, having this opportunity to, uh, to just move on. Um, but I'll, I will ask for questions at the end. So if you have uh, any questions, uh, please raise them then. So, uh, so this first topic is about using uh, machine learning for molecular dynamics and uh, and this is about improving the ways in which we can use these tools um, to extract information from molecular dynamic simulations and enhance the sampling process. So uh, the idea that I'm going to talk about is based on diffusion coordinates, uh, the diffusion maps. Um, and it's, it's really a, a beautiful idea. Um, it says essentially that if you have a bunch of data that's, uh, that's uh, you know, that is, uh, sampled from a, a particular uh, canonical measure, you can relate the, uh, the, the generator of the a corresponding diffusion process to the eigenvectors of a kernel matrix constructed purely from the data. 
Now, I'm not going to go into all the development and the machinery of these of these diffusion maps, but uh, you know many of you have seen these techniques. And from, from our point of view, this is just a technique from which we can extract the coordinates of a low dimensional representation for a, a data set. So the idea is you have data, it could be high dimensional, nominally Euclidean in Euclidean space with high dimension, but there's an underlying low dimensional manifold you would like to learn a, a, a representation for that manifold. And this is building on a lot of nice work by people like uh, Gigeli Clementi, uh, uh, Garrett Homer, Yanis Kevrakidis, uh, Jim Feng Lu, um, Aaron Dinner, and John Weir. There's uh, many more as well. So uh, this is an example just to show you the kind of information you can get. So this is learning the committer function using diffusion maps. And this really builds on the idea. I mean, we did this independently, but then we found out that actually it appeared in this paper by uh, Jian Feng um, from 2018. There's a slight problem with Jian Feng Lu. He's sort of uh, very hyperactive at the moment in this in this space, and uh, so somehow you have to very be very careful as you're writing papers to watch what he's doing because he's just moving into every area extremely fast. Um, but anyway, um, this is a I think a, a a nice example. So this is uh, you know just figuring out from some sample data generated using, this is actually generated using a molecular dynamics and enhanced sampling method that we've been developing with, with Eric Van and Iden and Jan Feng Lu. Um, it's called infinite swap simulated tempering. So generating these trajectories, um, you could actually extract the committer function. And there's a couple of step, steps in that. This is for a, a deca alanine uh, molecule. And it's, it's just giving you a lot of information about the transitions between different states. So you really can learn how those transitions happen. Um, now, the the addition that we've made in this field. So, as I said, there were there were a number of authors, uh, Clementi, Homer, and so on, who have done work in this area and they've done a lot of very good work. What we've done is to try to make this more precise and to make a more uh, reliable and robust framework by using the technique of the quasi-stationary distribution. This is a way of localizing sampling, which is not so ad hoc as just sort of chucking stuff out if it goes out of the region or ignoring it. Um, so this is where you actually introduce a distribution that has a finite uh, domain uh, with the idea that you can then extract an accurate distribution in that, in that subdomain. And you can use that as an approximation method for the distribution on the full domain. So here, I'm showing you a picture of the quasi-stationary distribution uh, for different choices of that domain. And by changing the support of that distribution, you're actually able to get a better and better approximation to the full distribution of the double well. But what it allows you to do is to focus the sampling on the domain uh, of interest or a particular domain and to get a very refined approximation. Now, the way you use the QSD, the way you compute the QSD is typically by using something called the Fleming bio process, which is where you run a collection of N Brownian walkers from the interior of the domain. And whenever any one of them reaches the boundary of the domain, you resample its position uniformly from those of the other walkers, and then you continue. And uh, you can show that this converges in law, in probability law, to the uh, quasi-stationary distribution. So this is a way of, of kind of uh, really calculating this thing. It's a, it's a computational process for the QSD. And what we did was to apply that for diffusion maps. So we used quasi-stationary distributions to localize the diffusion maps. And so here in a problem where you have kind of uh, two sort of scales that are present, you can, you can capture different parts by using uh, localized point clouds. So if you, in other words, if you're interested in the, uh, the first GC, you won't see it if you only have data from one of the wells, but you can capture both of these using the quasi-stationary distribution. So by using the QSD, you can decide sort of whether you're focusing on you know, one or the other um, uh, you know, transition behavior in your, in your molecular system. And that gives you a way 
you've got to refine what you're doing is you're building a collective algorithm for uh, combining molecular dynamics with the extraction of of, of uh, low dimensional coordinates and then the acceleration. So uh, I'm going to show you a, a picture here for the alanine dipeptide. And one of the things that you can do using the diffusion map is to detect metastable state transitions. So this is often a very difficult thing to quantify. You don't know when you actually made a transition but you can actually see it directly in the spectral information that you obtain using diffusion maps. So this is a tool for uh, learning what is actually happening in the molecule as you're, as you're exploring its, uh, its, its state space. Uh, ben, this leads to, just, oh yes, can there's I just, a question. Just to let you know, you've got sort of 10 minutes left before we want to stop for the questions, okay? Okay, right. I'll, I'll, I'm almost done with this first section. Yeah, I think we'll just have time. It should be fine. Um, so this is an idea um, for a combined algorithm where you run MD, refine using the quasi-stationary distribution, find physical collective variables uh, closely associated to the leading diffusion coordinates. So this is an additional step. You have to actually identify those physical collective variables. And then you can use those to bias MD using metadynamics. And then um, using the spectral change information, you can decide when you're actually moving to a new uh, state and when you're exploring a larger region in terms of the sampling you're after. And from the, uh, this method, you can extract free energies, uh, the physical collective variables themselves, which are often very interesting, and committer functions. So that's an idea we've been looking at. Um, as an example, I can just show you this picture here. Uh, so this is for Chignolin, and uh, it's showing uh, this, uh, the, this, the diffusion coordinate landscape uh, colored by the first, the, the learned physical collective variable that we get from the diffusion map. So we use diffusion maps, and then we relate this to, to collective variable, physical collective variable, and then we, we uh, relate the, the physical collective variable to a coloring in this in this uh, domain. So I think that's a that's just an illustration, but uh, that I think is a, is a nice uh, direction for research. And we're, we're now exploring this with Antonia May here in chemistry and Aaron Dinner in Chicago. Okay, now the second uh, topic that I wanted to describe was using molecular dynamics for machine learning. I'll have to go fairly quickly through this. Um, so the idea here that we're exploring is to use an analogy between uh, machine learning and the loss landscape and um, the energy function. I have, unfortunately, a phone call. Hello, I have to call you back. Is that all right? Fine. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so the... Uh, the idea here is to just use the view the parameters of the Bayesian model as positions in molecular dynamics. And there's a reason to do this because it gives you a way to explore the landscape in a, in a different way than people are currently using. And uh, so we can actually make a more, let's say, a, a more varied approach to, the, to this uh, optimization of the parameters, the selection of the parameters. Um, so, uh, to give it a perspective that relates to the idea of, of tempering in uh, molecular dynamics, um, the typical way that people choose the parameters in machine learning is to optimize the, uh, the loss landscape. And uh, what we're doing is, you can imagine incorporating a temperature which allowed it, allows us to interpolate between the pure uh, map or you know, this optimization framework, maximum a posteriori probability, and the pure Bayesian framework. So uh, we actually have now a new parameter that allows us to explore the landscape in different ways. Um, if you look at the landscapes of neural networks, they are actually quite interesting. And in some cases, they can have a lot of complex structure. In other cases, they're relatively simple. So one of the things that we'd like to do is to actually be able to visualize these lost landscapes. And another thing about the idea of using temperature is that we can, we can explore using ideas for um, 
like it related to sampling rough landscapes in the setting of neural networks. So there's a very nice paper from 1988 by Swansig on diffusion on rough landscapes, which, uh, which states that you can use a temperature to accelerate the, uh, the exploration on, uh, you know, if you have a, an energy scale, let's say epsilon for the potential barriers, these fine potential barriers on the landscape, you can choose temperature parameters uh, related to that in order to enhance the sampling. The idea basically is that you're, you're, you're not getting stuck in all these little wells, you're sort of bouncing rapidly out of them. Um, so we're trying to use that in machine learning. And you know the, the way that people typically do machine learning is using something like stochastic gradient descent, which is a basically a gradient descent algorithm with a randomized gradient, which is constructed by using partial uh, data sets. So you just subsample the data and that introduces a randomness into the process. Um, here's a movie actually showing you for a very simple classification problem, how that goes. So it's finding a classification which represents a high contrast, uh, you know, uh, relationship between the data and the and the background coloring in this picture. Um, you can this idea of, of stochastic gradient descent can be put into the context of sto stochastic differential equations, and it allows you a nice link to molecular uh, modeling concepts like diffusion in molecular systems. Well, we've been exploring these kinds of models and, and more general ones uh, in order to find rapid training algorithms. And um, you could say that one of the things that we've been exploring is similar to the stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics method, which adds additive noise into the system. So if you think about how the stochastic gradient descent algorithm looks, the SDE that you get has a multiplicative noise term, which comes from this stochastic subsampling that's used to construct the gradient. So this is the gradient noise is introducing this multiplicative noise. And the idea in SGLD is that you add in additive noise. You actually drive it with some additional temperature. And um, so I just show you that you can use temperature in this way to accelerate things. So these are, these are using Langevin, underdamped Langevin algorithms with different temperatures. And what you find is that at high temperatures, the additive noise completely corrupts the, the, the optimization process. But at lower temperatures, you see actually a band in temperature where, and you can see here it's for 0 0.001, 0 0.001, and so on, but not all the way down at point, uh, 10 to the minus seven. You can see that the, the, uh, the sampling is much improved and that actually the optimization is much improved by uh, adding in some uh, additional thermal noise. Now, why does it help? Well, there's lots of possible reasons, you know, in addition to the sort of the, the very generic model of Sonsig. Um, the idea that I have is that we're able to keep in play a useful model reservoir during the training process. So we can activate different parts of the, of the model uh, architecture that we have available to us in order to enhance the accuracy at any stage during the training. Just using multiplicative gradient noise is in some sense fickle. It's not an ergodic process, so you don't actually know exactly what you end up with in that, and it leads to an unpredictable behavior. So I'd say it's less robust. Um, so there are many different Langevin algorithms. These are the sorts of ones that we've worked on. And I'm just gonna show you an example of a method that we came up with by combining different schemes. So we put together something called adaptive Langevin, which is the method at the bottom here, which is a kind of a Nosei Hoover thermostat for driven systems. And we combined that with Langevin dynamics using layer partitioning in a neural network structure. And it turns out that this method was very powerful. So this is the method in the lower corner here. And what I'm showing you is a very tightly wound spiral data set. So there are two different spiral arms here and you're trying to classify them. So you're trying to separate them, put them on colors that show a high contrast. 
And as you can see, the ADLA-LA method, which is this combined method, achieves much better sampling accuracies, much better test errors. And, um, and, and you know, that's using exactly the same amount of computation as a well-tuned atom. Atom is a, is a more efficient optimizer than stochastic gradient descent or the straightforward Langevin or damp Langevin technique using Beowulf Langevin dynamics. Um, so I, I don't go into all the details of this, but I just show you it's a, based on this partitioning of the system into different, uh, using different integrator families. And we have a whole collection of methods of this type. And there are some, there's some intuition from the neural network community on why it might be important to separate the, the layer structure uh, more, let's say a more diffusive dynamics for the early layers in a network. Um, just to show you a couple more examples. So this is again for spiral data, showing you how the test accuracy is much improved by using the LLA method. And um, we've tested other systems as well, like poker hands, where you try to learn poker hands from observation. Um, and again, it's, it's way better. And I think that this actually is going to be true for a large, large class of problems that have complex landscapes, as you get, for example, in logic learning. And, uh, and then also, this is another application we've employed this in. This is the fashion MNIST. So you can see these fashion items here, they're just being tagged according to which one they are in the same way that digits can be tagged with, with, with numbers. And uh, so this LLA method uh, is really improving the adaptation as we throw in more fashion items into the picture. Okay, I know I have to wrap up. Uh, actually, that's my last slide. Um, so uh, the summary is here. Um, and, uh, you know, just I, I've shown you some examples of how we're using both machine learning methods to improve molecular dynamics sampling and also molecular dynamics algorithms in machine learning in order to accelerate things. And we have lots of ideas for extending these. In particular, I would mention for the MD for ML, we're looking at new constrained regularization techniques that use ideas and methods like shape from molecular dynamics and actually our own geodesic uh, integrators in order to enhance the, uh, the, the properties of the learned models in machine learning. Okay, I better stop there. I'm sure that Peter is getting uh, agitated. I can't actually see him. So this is another nice feature of the system. Uh, thank you for your attention. Ben, thank you very much. That's uh, very fascinating. And you do, you have allowed us a couple of minutes at least for questions if someone would like to pose them. I'm not totally sure how this is going to work, but does anyone want to ask a question? They have to make their mic open. Can we see anyone? I think Ola is trying to say something, but it's coming out a bit muffled. Let's try again, Ola. Uh, no, sorry, I just unmuted me because I'm the next speaker. Ah, OK, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Can you see better than I can, Emily, from a sort of master organizer perspective? Uh, Gianni, did you have anything to say? He's unmuted, I just wondered. <laughs> So Ben, if no one else is going to ask, let me just pose you one thing. You're probably familiar with some of the things that, that I've written about how we bring together these things or run into trouble. I mean, one of the, the standard uh, features of basically m most machine learning algorithms is this assumption of smoothness and continuity. I was interested in your early slide on the instability of mappings and so on mm -hmm. and assumptions. The question is whether assumptions that are underlying kind of in implicit because people aren't thinking of them. The, the assumptions that are underpinning the machine learning algorithms might be incompatible with some aspects of the actual physics. So that's one of the yeah, questions as to very really hard right now learning. on smoothness um, in, in uh, machine learning algorithms in neural networks. So we'd like to, we're, we're relating all of these ideas back to smoothness because the natural mathematical concept. And one of the things that we're learning is that by controlling the parameters in the neural network using constraints, we're able to control the smoothness. We're now trying to get that to be a quantifiable relationship so that actually you can 
adjust your neural network to have a certain specified level of smoothness. And uh, so that would allow us to control whether or not the, the network categorizes nearby images as very different ones, uh, you know, something like that. 